Could a visit to Taiwan spark violent conflict with China? Beijing says its military won't stand by idly if the U.S. House Speaker visits Taipei on her tour of Asia. But can Chinese threats dictate U.S. leaders' decisions? And what does that say to the people of Taiwan? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taipei. As Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi holds the third most powerful position in the country. So a trip to what China sees as its breakaway province could carry tremendous consequences. So much so that at the time of this recording, Pelosi still refused to confirm whether she'll visit Taiwan or not. I don't ever talk about my travel because, as some of you know, it's a security issue. It's a security issue for every member of Congress traveling, especially abroad. But for the speaker, it is an additional uh, security issue and for those traveling with me. Well, the term security issue might be an understatement. As The New York Times reports, U.S. officials have expressed concern that China could respond to Pelosi's trip by firing missiles into the Taiwan Strait send fighter jets into the province's airspace, or stage military exercises near the territory's borders. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy has deployed four warships to the area, including a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Ronald Reagan. And while the White House says it can't dictate a lawmaker's travel, President Biden has reportedly urged caution, while China's ambassador to the U.N. gave an even starker warning. As we we can see uh, such a visit is apparently very much dangerous, very much provocative. If the U.S. insists on, the, uh, 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 on making the visit, China will take firm and strong measures to safeguard our national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. Well, Taiwan is an obviously sensitive, even explosive issue for Beijing. Let's look at a few key dates to explain why. In 1949, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists set up the Republic of China government in exile in Taiwan after losing a civil war to Mao Zedong's communist forces. About 20 years later, in 1971, China forced Taiwan from its seat at the United Nations. In 1996, Taiwan held its first democratic presidential elections. China responded with missile tests near its ports. And finally, in 2005, China enacted an anti-secession law calling for the use of force if Taiwan attempts to declare formal independence. Now, Nancy Pelosi is the highest ranking U.S. official to visit Taipei since 1997, when U.S. House Speaker Newt Gingrich met with leaders of a newly democratic Taiwan. Well, China was a very different country back then and far from being a leading global economic and military power. So just how different and potentially dangerous would a visit from a U.S. House Speaker be today? Here to debate that are from Taipei, Ching Yi Lin. She's a Taiwanese legislator representing the Democratic Progressive Party. In Beijing, we have Zhu Qingdo, a political analyst who was formerly China Radio International's chief correspondent in Washington. And in the U.S. Capitol, Riley Walters is a senior fellow at the Global Taiwan Institute who also works with the conservative think tank, the Hudson Institute. Thanks all so much for being with us. Zhu Kindo, I'll start with you because in you. mentioning potential dangers, I've looked at some of your tweets where you've actually said, are the two countries destined for a war? If a war is unavoidable over Taiwan, shouldn't China prepare for the worst? So Pelosi's plane falling from the sky is probably acceptable choice. I needed you to tell me what that means exactly. Yes, I try to convince uh, this is the feeling, the sentiment inside China, how strong it is, and what about the will and the determination of the Chinese public in terms of defending their national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. Remember a few days before, I would suppose a visit by Pelosi to Taiwan, uh, President Biden basically repeated the U.S. commitment to the One China principle to President Xi Jinping. Uh, but later on, and when he turned and he sent Pelosi to visit Taiwan, he violated the One China principle. 
this is really not only the single incident, but also accumulation of issues since Biden, I would say, basically, since Trump came to power, and Biden received the, uh, the envoy from Taiwan in 2021, basically the first time since 1978. Uh, so you can see, and also five times, uh, five rounds of uh, arms sale to Taiwan since Biden, uh, since Biden took uh, the office. So you can see this accumulation of events of uh, uh, basically undoing this one China principle, which is the political foundation for these two countries' normal relationship. If it is gone, there's no relationship, no normal relationship. I'm, I'm afraid of, yes, uh, there could be a war between the two countries over uh, the issue of Taiwan. Mm, you're actually uh, considering that war is possible. I mean, because you have said that substantial countermeasures will be taken if Pelosi stops in Taiwan. I mean, are those countermeasures actually oh. active military measures? Um, um, for sure. It's really about uh, what kind of a specific measures, you know, military response from the Chinese side. I think all those just reveals how strongly the Chinese side feels about protecting their sovereignty and the national, uh, you know, territorial integrity. From the U.S. side, from our you know, people in China would say there's a lack of respect for this basic thing, you know. Uh, if you want to conduct a normal relations with another country, you have to follow the rules. Uh, I would say, you know, U.S. would say like a rules-based international order, let's say UN-centered rules-based international order. That's respect another country's sovereignty and a territorial integrity. Okay. You don't send a delegation to Catalonia to support independence in, in, in Spain or probably to the UK to support the Scotland to be independent of the UK. That will not be welcome, let's say, the least. Mm. Ching Yi Lin, what do you make yes. uh, of China's posturing here? I think, um, of course, usually China have a their very strong sentiment to Taiwan have relations with another countries. But I, I want to say for um, Taiwanese, actually, we have uh, um, used to the Chinese have uh, the um, uh, the uh, air, air force um, every day treat to, uh, to, to Taiwan. So I think Taiwan, we try to keep now the situations, but we tend to stop the relations with another countries, especially based on the, the same value. So um, that is um, why I think they're, they're totally different um, situations within Taiwan, especially um, today. Um, of course, we are very careful about um, the situations and the um, security in this area, but we also search for another um, possibilities to have a connections with another countries in this um, situation. Let me ask you, as a Taiwanese legislator and someone who is yes. not pro-Beijing on Taiwan's territory, mm -hmm. how far would you expect the United States to go to defend what you believe Taiwan's interests are? I think the most important is Taiwan should have the response, should have the right and have the ability to defend by ourselves first, just similar with Wukeland. But I know, I think in my um, understanding that in the um, Indo-Pacific um, strategy or the uh, regional security is not only the responsibility of Taiwan, mm. but also I think all we should to cooperate with uh, um, another countries, for example, US, Japan, Korea, Philippines. So I think that is a very important um, role for Taiwan to um, defense by ourselves and uh, cooperate with our friends. Okay, Riley Walters, I, I need you to tell me what Speaker Pelosi and the United States would actually get out of this. What would she want from this visit? And is it worth the ire that it's causing China? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's worth all the trouble. Um, you know, I think they they actually, to a degree, have botched this visit. It's perfectly within our right, uh, within our one China policy, which is different from China's one China principle, uh, to for Speaker Pelosi and others to visit Taiwan. Obviously, Newt Gingrich went in 1997. It wasn't that big of a deal then. He met with the president. So there's a lot of precedent already there. It's really, I think, uh, we've been forecasting this visit, which has allowed Beijing time to prepare a response, which we are seeing, uh, which we've been seeing over the last 12 hours. 
but to your question about what we really get out of this, hopefully we can reconfirm our US, uh, our one China policy, which I think is in question these days, not just within Washington, but within Beijing. And so reconfirming that I think will be the most uh, important of this. And of course, uh, reassuring our friends in Taiwan that we respect their democracy and we're, we're all there for defending it if there were to be an incident. I need you to explain when you say the one China policy versus the one China principle. I mean, is, is that just the United States trying to have it both ways? No, that is, that is our one China policy that we've had for over 40 years now. Uh, it's basically that we, we accept that there is one China. Uh, we don't necessarily say which way it goes, uh, but that we also say that, uh, you know, we respect the rights of both Taipei and, and Beijing and that uh, we will defend. We, we don't want to see any unilateral action actually across the Taiwan Strait. And so what we've actually been seeing, I think, recently is a push by Beijing uh, for in the narrative of their one China principle, which is different from ours because their principle is that there is only one China and it is the PRC, uh, which is different from our opinion. And so they've actually, in a way, been deteriorating and pushing it back against our one China policy. Okay, Xu Kindo, I mean, why isn't that good enough? That there's just a difference in opinion between how the United States interprets uh, what China sees as its one China policy. Uh, Andrea, it's not a different uh, opinion issue here. Uh, if you listen to what President Carter said in 1979 on January 1st, announcing the uh, establishing a diplomatic relationship with the People's Republic of China, he, he said you know, personally that the U.S. will not develop official relationship with Taiwan. That is part of his announcement. And I think that's a strong commitment. If we don't and, you know, make uh, true our commitment. If you don't follow our commitment to each other, how can we conduct uh, our relationship in a normal way? Because on one hand, you say, oh, we respect the one China, there's only one China. On the other hand, you support independence of Taiwan to separate this country from one part from this another part. So how can we trust you? This is a trust issue. I think there's a, you know, severe shortage of a trust. Uh, you know, basically it's a mutual, but it's in particular on the one China issue, President Biden, you know, repeated several times actually to President Xi Jinping about the one China principle. He said, oh, there's one China. We follow that. That's our commitment. But then after a while, he will do something that's exactly against the one China principle. So if that is the case, then, you know, how this is very confusing to the Chinese mm -hmm. side, you know, as our American friend said that, you know, he can't clarify what is your one China policy? You know, do you see Taiwan as another country? You know, Taiwan is part of China. There's only one China. Frankly speaking, it is, you know, there are 1992 consensus between Taiwan and the mainland. They say, oh, there's one China, both Taiwan and China, the mainland belong to that China. Taiwan, the U.S. or oh, Republic of China, the Chinese uh, mainland would say People's Republic of China. But if you look at the map, it's overlapping. So that's one China. Basically, tacit okay. agreement. We belong to one country. That's fine. Ching Yi Lin, I have to ask yeah. you, what, what will it say to you in Taiwan and to the Taiwanese people? if Nancy Pelosi does not visit Taipei? Um, actually, we understand all our friends are suffering from the straits from China. So in past decades, all we um, always try to um, pay more attention and a more um, uh, different way to cooperate with our friends. But I want to say first, um, we always we all we also um trust that one China, but the Taiwan is not China. So that is different between China uh, one China principle and the one China policy. But I must say um here um actually for Taiwanese until now even we um have uh, some um information about maybe um the speaker policy she were visit to Taiwan. But until she arrived, all we are keep our patience and uh, all we could to understand. Um, if anything um, interfered to her, um, it would be something um, maybe not so not so smoothly. So mm -hmm. in past decades, or Taiwanese, we used to the um, this very difficult situations between um, China and other countries and the international society. Fair enough, uh, uh, Riley. I have to ask you. You know, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said the decision is actually entirely the speakers herself as an independent member of, of Congress. But is it really, you know, we have to remember that there are 
also she and the president, representatives of the Democratic yes. Party, which should be working yes. in solidarity. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think that's definitely within her right. That was the precedent that Newt Gingrich set in 1997. He went as an individual. Uh, and it's it's no surprise that they're saying this now. Um, obviously, politics does play into some of this. Uh, you know, why go now um, of all time? I think, you know, there's a lot of concern about the safety of Taiwan, given what's happening in Ukraine and, of course, the close relationship between China and Russia. Uh, but uh, it, it is it is her personal right. And, and again, within the United States, one China policy for her to uh, to do this. Do you think the Chinese really believe it's, it's just within her right to make a decision that some would even see as rogue if the president is discouraging it? You know, that that's hard to say because, you know, it, it seems like anything that the U.S. does on Taiwan these days, the, the Chinese just get upset about anyways. So it's hard to differentiate between uh, what they think is is simply uh, an act of an individual or what they think is what they've been saying, a, a deterioration of our one China policy, which, which is kind of funny because they still don't recognize that we do have a separate one China policy from their one China principle. Okay. Zhu Kindo. If you want to respond to that, go ahead. If not, I'd like to ask you uh, another question. Yeah. No, you know, obviously, I, I, I think you have a good question, good point here. That is, Nancy Pelosi is the third ranking senior official of the United States. She's not like a private citizen. You know, I'm just uh, deciding to visit Hawaii or Texas, you know, to see friends or to see, you know, uh, to meet whatever officials or in my private capacity. No, she's a, uh, you know, leading uh, official delegation. So U.S. is developing official uh, relationship with Taiwan, which is against the one China principle, one China policy, even, you know, following the U.S. term, probably. It is totally wrong. U.S. is betraying their commitment to this relationship with China. So, so there's a, China has warned that, that there will be consequences, you know, for violating Chinese sovereignty and territorial integrity. And now we are having a crisis. So what's that for? Uh, that that okay. That visit is that important. She has to go to Taiwan and to create a crisis to show his she's important. I don't know. And Nobody I, actually I, figures out you know, what's her purpose here. Tell me how much this other factor plays in. I mean, yes, this, this is a top-ranking U.S. official, but it's also Nancy Pelosi who who visited Tiananmen Square 28 years ago to stand up for those who fought mm -hmm. for human rights and democracy in China. How much do those images still disturb? Beijing today, and how much are they factoring into Beijing's response to her visit specifically, potential visit now? No, no, uh, that's not a factor, I would mm -hmm. say, uh, in today's situation. You know, we mentioned earlier, actually, uh, Genrich, you know, Speaker Genrich, Speaker Genrich in 1997 did visit Taiwan. But before that, she visited Beijing and then stopped in Taiwan. In Beijing, he told the Chinese leader, we are for the one China policy. We respect that. That's the U.S. consistency, consistent policy. And we wish you a peaceful reunification of the Chinese mainland and in Taiwan. Uh, so, and also remember, he's from the Republican Party. Well, the executive branch is controlled by the Democrats, you know, by, led by President Bill Clinton at that time. So you can see, I think the Chinese side understood that, that oh, there's a, you know, domestic a political struggle, politics, you know, the Republicans and Democrats. So the Republican House Speaker say, you know, that's my right. I will go to Taiwan. I will go to Beijing. OK, I think the Chinese side understand that particular situation. But Nancy Pelosi and uh, Biden from the same party, obviously, uh, either they are playing bad cop, good cop, you know, some kind of a, we don't know, like uh, what, what kind of a theory, maybe for the midterm election to show that we are top on China. This seems to me, there's a lack of a sophistication on the US side, you know, what's your policy toward China today? Are you changing? If you are changing, why don't you talk about that? And you are saying, oh, we are still following the one China policy, but at the same time, you are hollowing out that kind of policy. You're, you're labeling it a lack of sophistication, and, and Riley, it was interesting to hear you say this was actually been a botched kind of effort. Uh, but uh, let us so, hope, yeah, there's this. There's some room for improvement there. But let, let me move uh, back to uh, Ch Ching Lin. You know, Pelosi yes. would be meeting with her Taiwanese House Speaker counterpart. She, as we're told, would be warmly welcomed by the government. But the people of Taiwan, I am hearing, are getting rather nervous. They're actually practicing air raid drills. No. They're stocking up on food and groceries from what we're hearing from our reporters. 
what do you think they want? And do they see the U.S. as a protector or are there those that see it as a provocateur? Um, I could to um, comment that yeah, really some part of people, they are a little nervous. But most of Taiwanese populations, um, some friends, they, they say today, um, even just like a New Year's Eve, so many people are very excited to welcome the very important um, uh, the guests to Taiwan. So uh, in my viewpoint, um, my party and many, many of Taiwanese, especially young generation, they really very welcome and very excited about her visit. So is it an exaggeration then from sources that we're hearing that people are stocking up on, on food, that they're doing, I mean, oh, no. <laughs> you haven't heard this at very all? Right. This is not happening? Um, in our, um, some, one of party in Taiwan, they have some young people, they say they are scaring about that. But um, that is very similar with their, um, their viewpoint about um, more friendly with China, maybe we're be more safety. But I think um, actually most of people understand that is not true. Okay. So most of people, they are very excited now. But Riley, I have to ask you, I mean, is there pot the potential for this to backfire, you know, somewhat terribly by opening the door, you know, for China to take action that otherwise would have been far more provocative, even premature, if, if Pelosi didn't talk about this visit? Uh, it's it's difficult because, you know, U.S. policy has not changed over the last 30 years, no matter what anyone says, whether it's the gaffes when President Biden says, you know, U.S. will defend Taiwan, or even now with Pelosi going, Biden saying, I don't think that's a great idea, you know, showing that there's not agreement within the Democratic Party. Uh, but so really the onerous of this is on the Chinese side. Uh, and which I think is the U.S.'s fault because we've given them so much time to prepare a response to this visit. It would have been much better if she just went to Asia and then all of a sudden we get news reports that she popped into Taipei. We wouldn't have, I think, as much of this uh, opportunity for some sort of conflict breaking out. But if there is to be one, you know, it really, the that much of that lies within China, Chinese, the Chinese court because Again, U.S. policy hasn't changed, and it's you well know, but within her Riley, right. as you say that, yes, U.S. policy, you can argue, hasn't changed, but China certainly has. So right. doesn't U.S. diplomacy need to evolve along with a changing China that is far more powerful economically and militarily than it was 30 years ago? Possibly. And, you know, I think there's probably going to be good talk about how we need to change our, our the U.S.'s Taiwan policy uh, once there's a new Congress next year. Um, there, I think there's, there's been growing concern about this, like you said, with, with the growing China and them becoming more belligerent on these sorts of issues. But um, really, it, it, right now, if we're thinking about what could happen right now, it's, it is on the Chinese side, and it's up to them to kind of hold themselves back. Okay, Zhu Kindo, go ahead. Well, uh, let, let, I don't know. Like, if we be honest, uh, and we can see the changing uh, U.S. policy toward China, you know, with Trump, they started this uh, trade war and then tech war and the crackdown on the most in, uh, innovative Chinese uh, uh, companies. And now uh, Biden basically followed the, the footstep of Trump, you know, uh, without lifting any tariffs of imported Chinese goods. And they are having this CHIPS Act, no investment in China. And now they are sending Nancy Pelosi to provoke China on one China principle. You say there's, you know, it's, it's not changed. Of course, it had changed and changed for the worse, unfortunately, you know, because this world requires these two important nations to work together for the peace, for the sake of peace and stability. We have a Ukraine war, we have a climate crisis, we have food crisis, we have, you know, energy shortages, we have this inflationary pressure around the world. Do we need another crisis okay. created by the US side? created by Nancy Pelosi? No. Yeah, I, I have to get uh, one last question in uh, with uh, Ching Yi Lin, because, you know, we're saying yes. China has changed dramatically over the last 30 years, and so has Taiwan. Taiwan was a military dictatorship for decades and became a democracy, and U.S. policy did adapt to Taiwan becoming a democratic ally. So what does it say about the U.S.? 
actually defending democracy and, and allies around the world if it seemingly allows China to dictate its relationship with Taipei? Yeah, I think um, first I want to talk about um, to talk about the uh, commitment. China is the first one to broken the commitment, especially about the Hong Kong issues. And the second, I think because of the crisis, so this is why we need friends. All countries, we need to build the relationship with, with another countries. We need friends. Taiwan needs friends, US needs friends. All the countries, we need to build connections and corporations. So uh, I think um, in these situations, um, of course, we, we know we were suffer from uh, maybe the um, sanctions from China because uh, they always have this this way to treat Taiwan. But I think um, this time, um, Speaker uh, Pelosi should visit to Taiwan, especially she were mentioned about democracy and mm -hmm. human rights. I, th I think all the democratic countries will agree with that. All that is important value, always strong to um, stand with the value. Okay, Ching Yi Lin, I will have to give you the final word for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists really so much uh, for being with us. I'm sure we'll be discussing this again in the very near future. And to our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Newsmakers and do subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time. <laughs>